Well, good evening, and thank you for your invitation to join you this evening. It's um, great to see so many friends in the audience, and let me say thank you for everything that you do to keep our democracy alive, for um, connecting voters with issues, for giving our city new ideas and keeping us moving forward. You know, now more than ever, our city needs steady leadership to continue the progress that we've made. I'm proud that over the last three years, we've created over a thousand new jobs. We've strengthened and protected our neighborhoods, and we've made vital investments in public safety and infrastructure. And even though I am a nonpartisan mayor, as Democrats, you can be proud that while we wait for Jeff City and Washington, D.C. to make changes, you have a city and a mayor that is leading the way on progressive issues that matter to middle class families. You know, while Jeff City failed again and again and again to address the opioid crisis in Missouri, the city of Columbia joined with the county of Boone, and we worked together to form our own prescription drug monitoring program, and then joined with St. Louis County and other first class counties uh, across the state of Missouri to build a prescription drug monitoring program that helps patients and prescribers track opioids. Because addicted persons shouldn't be incarcerated, they need treatment. And these types of progressive common sense um, um, reforms that we need. And when President Trump withdrew from the Paris Climate Accord, I was proud to join with the mayors of Kansas City and St. Louis to, to join the Mayors for Climate Action. And together we are a group of communities that are organized um, to really adopt those changes that we need to reduce uh, and reverse even the impacts of climate change. Mayors for Climate Action now includes over 400 mayors um, in nearly, with nearly a constituency of 70 million Americans that are making those common sense reforms. Here in Columbia, I was proud to appoint the Mayor's Task Force on Climate Action and Adaptation Plan. Hallie Thompson is a member of that. Uh, it's an interesting cross-section of um, plant scientists and educators and business journalists and home builders and environmentalists and even brewers because Log Road Brewery said uh, their crops are getting more expensive because the growing season is getting smaller. If there's any reason why <coughs> we need to address climate change, it's because the cost of beer is <laughs> But it's not just about protecting the environment. It also helps our economy. It's also part of our responsibility to lead and to really build a city of Columbia that is resilient and prepared for those changes. And together with our great city staff, that task force is, is building that plan to really position Columbia over the next 30 and 50 years to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and prepare for that. And when the state legislature refused to pass a statewide non-discrimination law, once again, the city of Columbia led the way by adopting a new non-discrimination ordinance for housing and employment and public accommodations for both sexual orientation and gender identity. The state and county still have no policy. But more than that, I was proud to stand with the University of Missouri, with the Chamber of Commerce, with our Regional Economic Development Authority and great businesses like Shelter Insurance and Veterans United and Central Bank, to sign a statement of community principles that we reject unequivocally discrimination in any form on the basis of race and gender and sexual orientation and sexual expression and gender identity. Look, this is Columbia, Missouri. Yeah. We do not discriminate. And we should be proud to lead the way with other cities. I was proud to support an increase in Missouri's minimum wage. But once again, the city led the way by adopting a $15 an hour minimum wage for all new city employees. Because we know just like utilities and housing and health care costs have increased, so do our wages need to increase. One of the highlights of my administration has been the open, honest, and transparent, um, um, to make government more honest and, and transparent. You know, I initiated a transparency policy that the City Council unanimously adopted. We created a new open checkbook portal so that you can see exactly every <coughs> dollar that comes into the city and every check that the city writes to who. And we have a new sunshine portal so that any citizen can get access to information faster. 
Um, and I voted against every taxpayer giveaway to wealthy special interests. And I've conducted over 200 TV, radio, and media interviews uh, along the way to make sure the public knows what we're doing and why we made the decisions we did. You know, three years ago, I promised to make our government and our economy work for everyone. I am committed to diversity and equity and women. Since April 2016, anybody want to know how many women have been appointed to boards and commissions in the city of Columbia? Anybody want to take a guess? 50? 50? 80. 80? I'm proud that over the last two and a half years, we've appointed over 166 qualified women to city boards and commissions, including the very first woman to ever serve on the Water and Light Advisory Board since it was created in 1964. Mm -hmm. And last year, we appointed the second woman to serve on that Water and Life Advisory Board. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, women are more likely to pay the bills. They're more likely to be half of our, or more than half of our rate payers. And we're disregarding their impact every time we raise water and electric rates here in the city of Columbia. You know, when I took office, the city of Columbia had a C- minus on the Human Rights Campaign's Municipal Equality Index. I push for pro-LGBTQ equality and non-discrimination changes that helped Columbia earn a perfect score the last two years in a row. You should be very proud that Columbia is one of only two cities in the state to earn a perfect score, and sadly, as one of only 78 cities in the country to have a perfect score, it is more important than ever in this current political reality that welcoming cities like Columbia um, exist. Because when we make Columbia a welcoming city, our economy responds enthusiastically. Since I was elected mayor in 2016, we have recruited and retained over 1,075 new jobs with a capital investment of over $326 million. We've added high-wage, career-making, family-supporting jobs with benefits at Dana Corp and Aurora Dairy and Kraft. Uh, and the first Nuclear Regulatory Commission approved project since 1985 right here in Columbia, Missouri. But it's not just big businesses that are thriving. We've also created a startup accelerator fund that invests in small businesses and entrepreneurs. We've secured a smart growth grant to convert the business loop into a business-friendly corridor for makers and creators like cabinet makers and seamstresses. Because we want to create an environment where entrepreneurs can thrive here where college students with the next big idea can go from the drawing board to a bank dividend right here in Columbia. Like the Stanton brothers, okay? Two brothers that started off with six chicks that they got for free in elementary school in a stall at the Columbia Farmer's Market. And now they're the nation's largest retailer of free range eggs. Or Equipment Share, two other brothers that made a pitch on Reddy's Pitch Week where they conceptualize this idea for an app that connects contractors with heavy equipment that they're not using with contractors who need that heavy equipment. And now, just about two years later, they have over 327 employees, including 96 right here in Columbia. They're both a construction company and a technology company, and they're on track to do $400 million worth of business. And they started right here. That's the type of environment we want to generate. And the results to our economy are paying off. According to the Columbia Daily Tribune, Columbia is the only major metropolitan area in Missouri to grow jobs faster than the nation as a whole in the entire 21st century. Payroll has increased over 2% per year. That's more than twice the amount of the statewide average of 0.78. And we have one of the lowest unemployment rates at 1.6%, second only to Ames, Iowa in the entire country. And while our employment rates are going down, our quit rate is going up, meaning those employees who quit their job to get a higher paying one right here in Columbia. Columbia is the crown jewel of cities in the state of Missouri. But now more than ever, we need strong leaders and steady leadership to continue the progress we've made. I'm running for mayor to continue that progress by reining in taxpayer giveaways to wealthy special interests, by making government open, honest, and transparent, and making sure that sustainability and diversity permeate everything that we do. The future of Columbia is not a return to history. And I'm convinced that if we continue to 
strengthen and protect our neighborhoods and improve our city's infrastructure and ensure the transparent and responsible use of tax dollars. Columbia's best days are ahead. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Mayor Treese. Um, now I will read the questions to the candidate. He will have two minutes to respond to each one as we go. Okay, we'll keep time. And they are on the back of your agenda if you would like to follow along. Question number one. What model of community policing the, do you support? How would you help ensure the newly hired city manager and police chief will uphold this council's community-oriented policing resolution to improve relationships with the community? I appreciate all the questions you asked and they really informed um, my remarks and I am grateful for the question uh, that you have that allow me to kind of um, um, explain a little further. You know, the very essence of community policing is not what I want, but it's about what you want. And that's why for the last two years, nearly every month, we have met at Second Missionary Baptist Church with the NAACP and Race Matters Friends and Missouri Faith Voices and the United Way to explore what our community-oriented policing model should look like. You know, the council passed a resolution unanimously calling for a community-oriented policing. And we engaged in this nine-month-long citizen engagement process. We had town hall meetings in every ward and another one in the city council chamber. And personally, I believe community-oriented policing ought to be um, a philosophical, a culture shift transformation within our police department that empowers that individual police officer to have the stability and the consistency and the repetition that they need to have the same beat, the same constituent so that they can recognize what that neighborhood's needs are when they can see that there's something awry or that that person's porch light has been on for three days in a row or someone is driving the, the car that they shouldn't be driving. That's, I've had the opportunity to ride along with police officers and I am amazed by the patience and the discretion that they show on a daily basis with the people that they interact with. Um, but what we discovered is the police chief and the city manager were stonewalling and dragging their feet. They wanted to use community-oriented policing as a way to raise taxes. We don't need to raise taxes to raise expectations. And the, the mayor that you hire in April is going to hire the city manager who hires the police chief that is going to implement the values and the vision of community policing that you have shared with us at that. And I, the only way I can do that is to reflect what you have told me over the last two years to make sure that we continue to, to move that agenda forward. Okay, thank you. Our next question uh, came from a member of our committee who lives in the county. I will read it as it was given to me in the first person. Having recently been involved in a north side annexation proposal, as a county resident, I was profoundly ignorant of the city's agenda to bring newly developed properties into the city for a public water district agreement that provides the city with dibs on jurisdiction. The enticement of new taxpayers to the city residency has been the practice for some time now, and this informs the city's odd boundary lines. I want to know your position on this city growth process and what you understand to be the pros and cons. Is it possible to go back to growth campaigns followed by votes from both the city and the county? Might this better inform our fire, police, school, road, bridge, transportation, and utility growth planning for both the city and the county? Well, when it comes to annexation, that's a long question. When it comes to annexation, I believe we need to take care of what we have before we bite off more than we can chew. Um, you know, there are neighborhoods in Columbia that have been waiting years <coughs> promised sewer and stormwater improvements. There have been areas annexed into the city to connect to our sewer that are still waiting to be connected to our sewer. And so before we start extending city services beyond our city limits, I think we need to look at those annexation policies and, and have a litmus test. My litmus test is that the area has to be contiguous to our city limits. It has to be connected to us. We shouldn't run down a train or a train track or a railroad track or a, a, a street to, to annex a large piece of property just so that they can tap into the systems that you all have been paying for for the last 20 years as rent payers. I think we need to have a cost-benefit analysis for every area proposed to be annexed. Because look, after annexation, the city has to extend not just sewer services, but firefighter protection and public safety and storm sirens and sidewalks and fire hydrants and water 
um, streets and sidewalks, snow removal, all of those things that we are required to deliver to our own city residents that this resident sounds like she might be frustrated by, um, that we need to have some type of connection fee, if you will, or some type of owner participation that when you connect to us, you have some contribution to the legacy systems that all of us as ratepayers within the city limits have contributed to um, as, as taxpayers here. Okay, thank you. Next question. Recent budget cuts to public transport have greatly affected some citizens with disabilities in our city. Do you feel the cuts to public transport and paratransport were necessary, or would you take steps to return these services to previous routes or hours? What are your thoughts also on having Columbia City buses work as or to replace school buses for transporting students to CPS schools? Yes and yes. Um, look, the city has tried, our public transit system is broken, and we've tried expanding routes and no one is happy. We try to contract routes and no one is happy. But for the disabled community and our international students and scholars that are visiting here um, and our employers and potential employees that are trying to find a convenient and efficient way to get to their next job, it is important that we have a robust and dependable public transit system. We have a new transportation director now, and at our December City Council work session, I asked them to put all of the stakeholders in a room. There's no reason why we can't figure this out. But those stakeholders need to include the disability community and the international community and, and employers, particularly on Route B. I've met with all of the manufacturers like Dana and Kraft and Aurora. All of them could hire hundreds of new employees if there was a way that they could get to work. And that was one of the routes that we eliminated. I think we need to look at what are those axes routes, you know, straight up down Providence, straight up and uh, across Provin uh, Broadway, as well as those periphery employers like State Farm and Mizzou North and, you know, um, uh, VU, all of those entities that rely on this type of public transportation system. What I don't think we should do is consolidate student transportation services into our municipal bus system. You know, for years, state representatives have failed to fully fund the transportation categorical for school districts. And now they're trying to cost shift the student transportation needs onto cities. We wouldn't let a stranger hitch a ride on a yellow school bus and we shouldn't put kids on city school buses. The municipal bus operators have a much different um, training regimen than city, um, than school bus operators. I know because I've represented Teamster bus drivers for years. There are specific training requirements and background checks and safety requirements that go with being a school bus operator. And I don't think we need to risk student safety just to save money. Okay. Thanks for that response. And the final question, what ideas do you have for increasing diversity at all levels, but especially upper levels of city management? How would you foster an environment of inclusion? Well, hopefully we do that every day. You know, when I was a candidate, my very first candidate orientation on January 11th in 2016, I uh, was on a Saturday morning in City Hall, and they brought all the department directors in and all the um, senior staff, and not one of them were African American. And I dare say that hasn't improved much in the last two years. What I can tell you is that we are trying to build a city that looks like the community we seek to, to serve. And part of that is with our board and commissions. Um, I'm proud to have boards and commissions that reflect the community because I think it yields superior results. Um, you know, a lot of people throw words like diversity and inclusion around interchangeably. They're not. Diversity is having a seat at the table, but inclusion means making sure your voice is heard and listened to and respected. And it's only when we have that inclusion can we move forward with the type of outcomes that we all want and the reconciliation um, that we need. I talked about all the appointments that we've made to board and commission services, but you know, we have, we have moved the needle um, uh, so many ways to achieve that score on LGBT um, municipal equality index by introducing some flexibility with our bathroom policy and um, adding transgender uh, health insurance coverage for city employees. All of those things that we can always do better and that requires the mayor or it requires the commitment of a mayor who is willing to push the envelope not only in their actions but in their words. Thank you, Mayor Brian Shreve. I appreciate your time and comments this evening.
I would also um, encourage you all to reach out to him if your questions were not answered this evening. Um, round of applause. Thank you. Thank you for having me. The first time I spoke before the Boone County Democrat Central Committee was in 1977 when I was attempting to unseat then County Clerk Murray Glasscock who went to jail for 16 counts of stealing their office. The party endorsed me and the very smartest thing you can do in public life is to follow somebody who goes to jail. <laughs> <laughs> um, and since that time, I have done my level best to be what smart, hardworking, ethical, progressive Democrats want. And I did that as county clerk in 1977 when the county government was Lily White and Dixiecrat. And Roger and me and Wendy and uh, Joe Mosley and a bunch of us came in and changed this county. I hired, I believe, the first three African Amer American employees in the county in 1977. And if I were mayor of Columbia, Missouri, I promise you that the diversity at the top of the city government would reflect the values who actually goes out and works with the manager to make sure the diversity in the management of the city we don't just talk about it, we actually do it. People almost dropped dead when I hired Joe Stimmons into the county clerk's office. And I still know Joe, she's an old lady now, she's like, I'm an old guy and we still talk sometimes, but the fact is that changed things in Blue County government. In the legislature, many of you know, I did the Katie Trail. I did, remember Nancy Cruzan? Anybody remember Nancy Cruzan? Yes. I passed the bill to change the way we can um, deal with end-of-life decisions. I passed the first funding mechanism for Medicaid in the state of Missouri. It has produced hundreds of millions of dollars and was a national model. I passed campaign finance in the 80s. I sponsored a bill to make plastic trash taxable to actually impose a, a tax on trash, um, uh, plastic trash. I passed the biggest tax increase in the history of the state of Missouri. And when I came back with an all Republicans funded domestic violence, I passed the first appropriation for trafficked women, and I passed the appropriation to get study for um, eating disorders for girls so that uh, eating disorders could become a mandatory coverage area. I passed the first use of state money, state dollars, for birth control at the request of Pan, uh, Planned Parenthood. A lot of you were saying, Chris, we knew that stuff. That was then, this is now. We appreciate that. You are a good state representative. Good night and goodbye. And if I were asking you to vote for me for mayor, because I had done those things, that would be correct, but I am not. I'm saying that you should appreciate those things in the same way that a college football coach looks at a high school end. If he could catch the ball in high school, maybe he can catch it in college. And the things that I did in the legislature were the result of a lifelong deep commitment to the principles that you hold dear and that I hold dear. And I promise you that I will bring that same commitment to the mayor's office, which needs it badly. Mayor Therese talked about the progress, the things that are good about the city of Columbia. And the city of Columbia is a wonderful place. We've raised our kids here. It's been great for us. Those things are true today as they were true 20 years ago. Unemployment rate is always good in the city of Columbia, and I and many other people, including the mayor, have worked to make those things happen. But those are not unusual for Columbia. Those are why we are great, why we are unusual. They're not unusual recently. They are part of our core. 
And because I will do those things, I will apply that kind of, of tenacity, that sense of a badger. In Jeff City days, some people make fun of me and call me a badger. Well, that's right. I was a badger on eating disorders because parents came to me and said, our daughters are dying of anorexia. And I had to fight the insurance lobby and the pharmaceutical lobby over there. We got to stop. And that's what will apply to not climate change, man-made global warming. I don't want anybody to be confused about where I am on that subject. The city of Columbia is in a unique position because they can do more than many local governments can about this subject because we have our own utility. Probably, there's a whole range of things that the city of Columbia does excellently on this subject. But probably the biggest single thing we could do is to change the peak use. Everybody know what peak is? Right, the utility rates, the go drive way up during the summer, during July and August, during the afternoon, peak gets real high. And that's where we spend a lot, the vast majority of utility money, because you have to build facilities to meet that peak, right? You've got to be able to cover the very highest point on the hottest day in July. If you can drive that peak down, you can save lots of money and lots of energy. And that's what I'll try to do. And I'll apply that same sense that I went after the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical companies on eating disorders to dealing with the peak problem. I will also apply it to the use of how we rehabilitate those parts of this community that need it. I want you to think about uh, twin scales on the top, Garth on the bottom, Broadway on the south, Business Loop on the north. That area is old and flat. And the, the reason flat is important is because of the sewer problems. The city of Columbia has done a lot of work in that area on rehabilitating the municipal part of the sewer system. But you all know that there's a lot of houses in that neighborhood Mrs. Smith and her, her husband, who's now passed, have moved there in 1961. And she cannot afford anymore to fix her lateral line that she owns out to the street. But it's broke. And it's broke all over the neighborhood. And the city doesn't want to raise cane about it because they know Mrs. Smith will be in the street. The city has a very minor program to help fix that. What we need to do is instead of building on the outskirts, we need to devote community development money to rehabbing houses in that area and fixing those sewer lines, both to meet the environmental need and to make young get, make them more attractive for when Mrs. Smith and her kids sell a house, some young couple can move in to a house that's good, that's sanitarily appropriate, that's environmentally appropriate, and she can then the new family can live there and grow downtown. It's close to Gerbs. It's close to Lucky's. It's close to the, you can ride your bike everywhere. My son lives in that neighborhood. He rides his bike to work. His wife rides her bike. That's what we ought to do in terms of economic development, is work on those kinds of things where young people can live in downtown. I, too, have been very involved in economic development as a state rep. I've been on, many of you know, the various committees that we have to bring jobs in, to develop jobs, to find ways to solve the problems. Um, and those are good things, but they too often don't involve the people who are theoretically going to benefit. They involve people from the bank, and people from the builders, and state, state reps, and the mayor, and people like that. They don't involve ordinary citizens who are going to benefit from the jobs. I will make an effort, I won't make an effort, I will get people from moderate income circumstances into those kinds of positions and into those kind of committees. Because those committees make a lot of difference on a whole lot of reasons. When you are in those rooms, you know more about where the jobs are and what's happening. Oh, I gotta shut up. <laughs> I just got 30 seconds. I have 30 more seconds to yammer along here. Cool. 
look at the past and look at the nature of the job in the city of Columbia and think for a moment about who has a 40-year record of finding out what needs to get done and getting it done, not talking about it, and getting it done. And I am so grateful to you all. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. President. I will now ask the same questions that I asked Mayor Please. Trace. Um, question number one. What model of community policing do you support? How would you help ensure the newly hired city manager and police chief will uphold the council's community-oriented policing resolution to improve relationships with the community? I will make sure that the people who are terrified that their kids are going to be killed by the police are involved in the hiring. And that's real important because that's what African-American people in Columbia, Missouri feel today. They feel afraid of the police department and that is inappropriate. And you know what? It's not the whole police department. Is that me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you shut up. <laughs> this machine. Thank you. Did you call me just to do that? <laughs> Look, people shouldn't be afraid of police. They are today. We have to change that. We have to look for a chief who's going to be committed to change that. We need leadership. We need to create a climate and we need to put organization, people on the job. Because all, if you look at state government organizations, the action always follows the money. If you put, devote resources to the problem, then the problem will change. This is a problem that we as a community can solve, but it means actually involving, not paying lip service. That's why the longtime president of the NAACP, Mrs. Ratliff, is a supporter of mine for mayor because she knows me for a long time and she knows that I will do my level best to change that situation. The situation is not just bad for the African American community. The morale is low in the police department. Um, clearance of crimes is not what it should be. The department needs a lot of serious work. And I'm going to get after it and I'm going to stick with it and I'm going to fight into it and stay with it until it's done. Okay. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to get it done. I appreciate your comment. Next question? Sure. All right. I will read this in first person. I did not submit this question. <laughs> Having recently been involved in a north side annexation proposal, as a county resident, I was profoundly ignorant of the city's agenda to bring newly developed properties into the city per a public water district agreement that provides the city of Columbia with dibs on jurisdiction. The enticement of new taxpayers to city residency has been the practice for some time now, and this informs the city's odd boundary line. I want to know your position on this city growth process and what you understand the pros or cons to be. Is it possible to go back to growth campaigns followed by votes by both city and county residents? Might this better inform our fire, police, school, road, bridge, and transportation, and utility growth planning for both the city and the county? It might, and it might not. It's a real interesting question about whether you should have elections in both areas or how you do it. I, I remember when the law first changed. Um, the problem is it's expensive and sometimes it's unnecessary because sometimes you, ha you don't need an election, you, you have widespread agreement on it. This articulates an important problem with the City of Columbia government right now. The City of Columbia is a good government. The County of Boone is the Columbia School District is a good government, and the fire district is perhaps the best fire district in the United States of America. The fire district is on the verge of suing the city of Columbia because they will not make an agreement about fire protection. We have a situation right now where we have areas of the city of Columbia where both the Boone County Fire Protection District and the city have, quote in the law, responsibility to provide fire protection. But the law doesn't say who has command control. Both of them theoretically have command control. Those people in those areas are being double taxed. 
and they're being doubled by both the fire district and the city. And the reason those things are true is because the city of Columbia refuses to make a, an agreement that they've made for many, many years with the fire protection district about appropriate command and control, appropriate taxation, who's going to do the fires where. This is because the relationship between the management of the city of Columbia and the fire district is poisonous, as it is with the county and with the school district. Okay, thank you. Question number three. Recent budget cuts to public transport have greatly affected some citizens with disabilities in our city. Do you feel the cuts to public transport and paratransport were necessary, or would you take steps to return these services to previous routes and hours? What are your thoughts on having Columbia City buses work as to replace school buses for transporting students to CPS? If I'm mayor, I'm going to do everything humanly possible to make the buses available to handicapped people. And that's the end of that story. We can go get them. We're going to do what we have to do to get that job done. We're not going to allow money to keep people from getting to the doctor and getting to the grocery store. That's the first part of that answer. Mm -hmm. The second part of that answer is the city and the school district with the buses. The mayor, rep, as he said, represents the Teamsters. Now the city and the school district entered into negotiations about putting city school kids on the buses to take them to schools. Change their lines a little bit, change the times a little bit, we'll give you some money, we'll get some vouchers. Brian went to Jeff and lobbied against the bill to allow that to happen. Now, that's not illegal, but if you're the mayor of a city you shouldn't lobby against things that the city is trying to get done with its own school district. It's unseemly. It's a conflict. Everybody in this room understands conflict. He could have said, hey guys, I'm out of this. I can't work for the city. I can't work for the, for the Teamsters on this. I'm going to stay out of it. We all get that, right? No. He lobbied against the city and the school district. I disagree. I think that is bad public policy, and I think what that does is bring what is worst about Jefferson City to the government of Columbia. Okay. Final question. What ideas do you have for increasing diversity at all levels, but especially upper levels of city management? How would you foster an environment of inclusion? It's hard to answer this question in pretty words because I did it and I did it a lot. I hired African American people. If I am the mayor, the city manager will be in a position where we'll have conversations where we say, how did diversity inform your planning to hire this person? Are we asking this person what their point of view is? Are we asking them to say on paper what their point of view is with regard to diversity? You know what? There's competent women in the world. There's competent yeah. African Americans in the world. All you got to do is go hire them. You don't need to have flowery language about all that. You just need to hire them. It's not that hard. Okay. I would like to thank Chris Kelly for okay. his comments and answering our questions. I do encourage you to reach out to both the candidates for the mayor's position of the city of Columbia if your question was not answered.